there are moments in our lives uh, that, that often become etched into our, our memory. And, and I would imagine that you uh, probably have some of those moments already in your life. That there, there's, a, there's a something that you happened, something that happened, something that, that you experienced that has really marked you forever. It is just burned into your memory in such a way that you'll never forget it. And I know I have several of those things. And for me, some of those moments happen right here on this campus. Right? I, I was a camper here, and I'll dare to tell you this morning, 29 years ago. Right, my first year at Chehi. And although there are things that are different in places around here, some things are the same, like the carpet outside Chatlos, same carpet as when I was a camper. Same exact one. There are certain places, and, and I can remember those places, and I remember them because of what God did in my life while I was here. I, I can still look out at, you know, as we walk between here and, and the, uh, the cafeteria, that, that pathway, that hillside there, looked a little different back then, and that's actually where we would have our bonfires. And I remember the night that God spoke to me in a way that, that I, I knew clearly He was speaking to me about calling me into ministry. I didn't know what that meant. I honestly thought God was mistaken. I ran from that call for quite some time, but I'll never forget that moment. And there are just moments in our life, good and bad. Sometimes it's a traumatic moment. Sometimes it's a painful moment that are etched into our minds. And for the people of Israel... Certainly, there were days, there were moments, there were scenes that were etched into their minds forever. And I want us to consider a couple of them this morning. And what I want to do this morning is to discover this amazing refrain that really becomes the refrain of Israel. It's the one that was introduced to you by Mr. Bergen on Sunday night. To give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His has said, endures forever. And so if you have your Bible this morning, I want to invite you to turn to 1 Chronicles uh, chapter 16, because it's there that we're going to discover this little refrain for the first time. And, you know, I thought it was interesting as I was leaving breakfast, I, I, I heard you singing the doxology. And I was reading it lately that, that that doxology is part of a larger hymn, and it, it is an amazing little verse, powerful verse, glorious verse that was tucked inside a hymn that, that many would describe the other verses as rather ordinary and now often forgotten. And we're going to look at a hymn in 1 Chronicles 16 that is not boring at all. In fact, the whole hymn is incredibly glorious and powerful. But tucked in this hymn, we're going to find this refrain. And then we're going to attempt to trace this refrain through a few different passages in the Old Testament. And all the way from 1 Chronicles to 2 Chronicles, to Jeremiah, to Ezra, and to the Psalms. So we should be done by 1, maybe 2 o'clock, all right? Are you with me? But as we come to 1 Chronicles 16, it, it's an incredible scene. David has become the king, the king that God has chosen for his people. The king that God had anointed through the prophet Samuel when he was just a young man. And David has become king, and David has set his heart to bring the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark that, where God's presence is most clearly made known, where His glory is made known. And David wants to bring the Ark to Jerusalem. He tried before, and there was an incredible failure because they didn't seek God. They didn't inquire of God on how to do it. And it cost one man, Uzzah, his life. And so now they've inquired of the Lord and they are bringing the ark to Jerusalem. And this is a day, this is a memory that would be etched in their minds forever. And I, I just want you to imagine with me, picture with me, an incredible procession. Right? And, and we're going to see that music was a huge part of this day. Right? There, there were musicians appointed. Right? We're told that there were uh, musicians of all different sorts playing lyres, harps, trumpets. There were singers and choirs appointed for this day. And, and it's significant because as we discover this incredible phrase right, that contains this word has said, we're going to realize that, that music is central to understanding and experiencing and knowing what it is to actually understand this word that we said is almost undefinable. Right? I, I gave you a definition yesterday. It's, it's inadequate like every definition. Right? That, that has said is when the person or the one from whom you deserve nothing, right, chooses to give you everything. Our words, 
They're, they're, they're not adequate to completely be able to describe. And so music becomes a vehicle. Music is a language that communicates on a higher level than just mere words. I'm not telling you anything that you don't know this morning. But it's incredible to see the music that was involved in this procession. But there's this incredible possession, procession. And there are singers and musicians. The priests, they're dressed in white. And they're bringing the ark up to Jerusalem. And so just imagine thousands upon thousands of people lining the streets, right? Incredible music. There is celebration and joy. David, the king himself, leading the procession, he's dancing and celebrating before the ark as it comes up. And so we come to 1 Chronicles chapter 16. And I want us to see that once they bring the ark to Jerusalem, that there is a song, there is a hymn that was commissioned for that. And we find it in 1 Chronicles 16, beginning in verse 7. And I just want to read through that. We're not going to have time to, to break this all down. But I just want us to read and listen to and hear this incredible song. It says, On that day David decreed for the first time that thanks be given to the Lord by Asaph and his relatives. Give thanks to the Lord and call on His name. Proclaim His deeds among the peoples. Sing to Him, sing praise to Him, and tell about all of His wonderful works. Honor His holy name, and let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Search for the Lord and for His strength, and seek His face always. Remember the wonderful works He has done, His wonders and the judgments He has pronounced. You offspring of Israel, His servant, Jacob's descendants, His chosen ones. For He is the Lord our God, and His judgments govern the whole earth. Remember His covenant forever, the promise He ordained for a thousand generations, the covenant He made with Abraham, swore to Isaac and confirmed to Jacob as a decree, to Israel as an everlasting covenant. For I will give you the land of Canaan to you as your inherited portion. When they were few in number, very few indeed, and temporary residents in Canaan, wandering from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another, He allowed no one to oppress them and to rebuke kings on their behalf. Do not touch my anointed ones or harm my prophets. Sing to the Lord all the earth and proclaim His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations, His wonderful works among all peoples. For the Lord is great and is highly praised. He is feared above all gods. For all of the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before Him. Strength and joy are in His place. Ascribe to the Lord families, of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of His name. Bring an offering and come before Him. Worship in the splendor of His holiness. Tremble before Him all the earth. For the world is firmly established. It cannot be shaken. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice and let them say among the nations, the Lord is King. Let the sea and everything in it resound. Let the fields and all that is in them exalt. Then the trees of the forest will shout for joy before the Lord, for He is coming to judge the earth. And then here is our phrase. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, and His faithful love, His chesed, endures forever. And say, save us, God, of our salvation. Gather us and rescue us from the nations, so that we may give thanks to Your holy name and rejoice in Your praise. And may the Lord, the God of Israel, be praised from everlasting to everlasting. And then the people said, Amen. And praise the Lord. As far as we know, this is the first time that Israel has sung this incredible phrase. And the whole hymn, right? I mean, we could spend hours upon hours going through the lines of this hymn. The incredible praise. But as you just take it in as a whole, right? It it, it captures you in such a way to realize that this day, this was such a glorious and amazing event. And I promise that no one that was there that day, forgot this day, right? There wasn't a time 10 or 15 years later that that people were gathered around and talking and saying, hey, do you you remember when we brought the ark up? Do you remember? No, I I don't really remember that. What was it like? No, no one would have said that. This memory would have been burned, etched into their minds forever, right? The incredible music, the procession. The glory, the splendor, David, the king, dancing with all of his might before the Lord. And then this glorious and incredible song. And tucked in that song, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His has said, endures forever. 
This refrain, this line, is going to become central to the liturgy of Israel. It's going to be central to who they are as a people, central to their worship. And as such, I think it's an important thing for us to consider. And to consider, what does that mean for me? What does that mean for me as a follower of Jesus in 2024? What is that, how does that impact my faith and my walk? Well, I, I want us to think about that as we trace this refrain. The next time that we hear this, this refrain is going to be in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 5. Right? And our theme verse, 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 13. So if you have your Bible still open, turn to the next book, if you will, 2 Chronicles. And while in 1 Chronicles we find this phrase embedded in, in this lengthy and glorious and beautiful hymn, now we're going to find it sung in isolation. And of course, as we come to 2 Chronicles 5, we have gone through David's reign, and David's reign was marked by not only successes, but also incredible sorrow and tragedy. And a lot of that sorrow and tragedy it was due to David's own sin and failure. And that's another story for another day. But on this day, Solomon, his son, has taken his throne. He is king, and Solomon has undertaken the task that was on his father's heart, which was to build a temple for the Lord, a permanent structure in their mind a place where His glory would dwell, a place where He would be worshipped. And so Solomon has built a temple. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, we, we are finding the beginning of the dedication of this glorious temple. And so there's a great assembly of the people. And we're told that the elders of Israel, the people of Israel, they are there and they've brought the Ark of the Covenant up to the temple. And there's a description of all that. And then 2 Chronicles 5, beginning in verse 11. It says, When the priest came out of the holy place, for all the priests who were present had consecrated themselves, regardless of their tour of duty, the Levitical singers, Asaph, of Heman, of Jeduthun, and of their sons and their relatives, dressed in fine linen, with cymbals and harps and lyres, were standing east of the altar, and with them 120 priests blowing trumpets. And the trumpeters and singers joined together their praise and, thank, and thanks to the Lord with one voice. And they raised their voices, accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and musical instruments in praise to the Lord. And what did they sing? For He is good, and His chesed endures forever. And the temple, the Lord's temple, was filled with a cloud. And because of the cloud, the priests were not able to continue ministering for the glory of the Lord filled God's temple. And again, what an amazing scene, right? Something that every person who was there never forgot the rest of their life. They could see it. They could hear it. They could remember it, right? This glorious and incredible day of worship and of praise and all of the people proclaiming that the Lord is good and that His head, His chesed, His faithful, enduring covenant love his mercy, all of these things that are wrapped up into that one concept and that one word, that they will endure, that it will last forever. And as they worship God, God's glory falls on that place and they are so overcome. It says that they could do nothing but bow down and worship. Right here we're told that they couldn't continue ministering. They couldn't do anything more. Then in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, Solomon himself, the king, will stand on a bronze platform and he will raise his hands to heaven and he will kneel down and he will pray a glorious prayer. He will pray a prayer that recounts God's faithfulness. He will pray a prayer that, that, that implores God to offer his forgiveness when people come to seek him. He'll pray a prayer that asks for God's protection and blessing over the nation. It's an incredible prayer. I invite you to take time in your own devotions to, to read that in 2 Chronicles 6. But notice in 2 Chronicles 7, it says, When Solomon finished praying, fire descended from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests were not able to enter the Lord's temple because the glory of the Lord filled the temple of the Lord. And all of the Israelites were watching when the fire descended and the glory of the Lord came on the temple and they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and they worshiped and praised the Lord and they said, for he is good. His faithful love 
his has said, endures forever. It's such a simple refrain. Words that are easy to remember and to memorize. But it contains an unfathomable mystery and wonder at the depths of who God is, of his worthiness, of his character. And this phrase, as we see it here, in such an amazing day of worship. And yesterday, I, I said that when you encounter God for who he is, and when you truly discover his, his kindness and his compassion and his love and his mercy and his forgiveness, when you encounter his goodness, no one will have to tell you to worship. You know, sometimes we have to be told to do things. We have to be told to be quiet. Someone is speaking. We have to be told to go to our lesson. We have to be told to do something that we need to do. Some of your parents have even told you to take a shower, right? Anybody? But no one, no one has to tell you to worship once you truly encounter him. No one had to say, now it's time to bow down and worship. No, they, they instinctively knew what to do when they encountered God for who he is. And it's my prayer for you and for me that we would encounter God for who he is so that we could worship him for who he is. I want to fast forward now, still in 2 Chronicles, but many, many years. 2 Chronicles 20. I know we're, we're moving along this morning, but I think it's important because I, I want to help you see and feel this theme being woven through the, the life and the fabric of Israel. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, the, the, the nation of Israel has now become two different distinct nations. The nation of Israel in the north and the, the, the kingdom of Judah in the south. And this is a scene from the kingdom of Judah. And in 2 Chronicles 20, the Ammonites and the Moabites, powerful enemies of Israel, who at this time have large armies, larger than, than Judah's forces, and they have come out against Judah. And Israel's king, Judah's king cries out, Jehoshaphat. He cries out to God and he prays and he asks God for mercy and for help because they're facing a battle that's larger than they can face. And you know, in life, you're going to face battles that are larger than you can face. You know, a lot of times we like to think that I'm strong enough to handle this. I'm tough enough to handle this. I, I can get through this. But you will, and, and many of you say, I, I, you already know this, but you will face battles that you cannot fight in your own strength. But here's the incredible good news. Right? God doesn't intend for you, expect you, or want you to fight those battles. Right? He wants to fight those battles on your behalf. And in this case, as Jehoshaphat sought the Lord, right, there was a man that prophesied. His name was Jehaziel. And he prophesied that the battle didn't belong to them, but the battle belonged to the Lord. And that the Lord was going to deliver them. And all they were going to have to do is sing. And I know Mr. Bergen mentioned this on Sunday night. But he said that, that, that worship, our praise, is, is a weapon. And it's a weapon in many different ways. We could, we could spend hours just talking about how that, that is true. But in here we're going to see that their praise was the instrument that God used to defeat their enemy. And so in 2 Chronicles 20... Verse 20, it says, In the morning they got up early and they went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And they were about to, as they were about to go out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God and you will be established. Believe in his prophets and you will succeed. He calls them to faith. Then he consulted with the people and appointed some to sing for the Lord and some to praise the splendor of his holiness. And when they went out in front of the armed forces, they kept singing. And what did they sing? Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His hesed endures forever. And at the moment they began their shouts and praises, the Lord set an ambush against the Ammonites and the Moabites and the inhabitants of Mount Seir who came to fight against Judah, and they were defeated. Right? This refrain is central to the life of Israel. And here God instructs them and leads them to use this praise to defeat the enemy that they were facing. Jeremiah, we're flipping over a few books. If you, you, don't, you can either just jot down the reference and look it up later or you can turn there with me. But when we come to the prophet Jeremiah, Judah is now in a very, very dark place. Because although God has sent warning after warning, the people of God have rebelled against him constantly. They've refused to listen. Right? Jeremiah was a, was a, a prophet who suffered incredibly. 
Right? In fact, in Jeremiah 33, as, as we're reading this chapter, he is not a free man. Right? He often was imprisoned. He was often tortured. He went through incredible suffering. He was, most of all, not listened to. But God, although He would bring judgment, right? He brought judgment on, on the northern kingdom of Israel through Assyria when they refused to listen. He used Babylon to judge Judah. But throughout all of that, throughout all of His judgments, right? because God is just, and He does judge, and He is patient. Remember we talked about that yesterday? He sent warning after warning after warning. But even though He brought His judgment, He maintained His faithful loyal covenant love with His people. Because His faithful love is dependent not on our faithfulness, not on our obedience, not on our performance, but it's dependent on who He is. And it never fails. And so in Jeremiah 33, verses 10 and 11, a very dark time in in Israel's much judgment, judgment was coming and it did come, but it says, this is what the Lord says, in this place which you say is a ruin, without man or beast, that is in Judah's cities and in Jerusalem street, that are, de- that are a desolation, without man, without inhabitant, without beast, there will be heard again a sound of joy and gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the bride, and the voice of those saying, praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good. His chesed endures forever as they bring thank offerings to the temple of the Lord. For I will restore the fortunes of the land as in the former times. Thus saith the Lord. God maintains His faithful, loyal love to His people even when they utterly fail and disobey. And God keeps His promises. In the book of Ezra, Ezra chapter 3, verse 11. You don't have to turn there, but just if you want to jot it down for your reference. But this is after... God's judgment through the Babylonians, the captivity, which lasted 70 years, and then God began to bring His people back to the land. And in the book of Ezra, as they're beginning to rebuild the temple, it says they sang praise and thanksgiving to the Lord, for He is... Anyone want to guess what they sang? For He is good. And His what? His has said endures forever. And then all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the Lord's house had been laid. Throughout the Old Testament, we're going to see this theme. Throughout the Psalms, right? The Psalms are filled, right? The Psalms, Israel's hymn book. They are filled with expressions of God's loyal and covenant love. And many of them, some of the most familiar ones, right? Psalm 23, right? I mean, if you don't know any Psalms, right? You know Psalm 23. But what does David proclaim in Psalm 23? He says that goodness and chesed will follow me all the days of my life. And David was a man who experienced that. And David was a man who experienced the the depth and the beauty and the truth of this word. Because David was one who realized that he was one who deserved nothing from God. Although God had anointed him and chose him as a young man. And although David had a heart that truly was in tune with God, that truly loved God. And David had a heart to serve God and to live for God. And for so much of his life, he embodied what faithfulness to God looks like, what what loyalty to God looks like, what worship to God looks like. But of course, you know that David, also just a man, sinned incredibly against God and against others. But David came to experience and know that although his sin meant that he deserved nothing from God, nothing but judgment, but God offered him forgiveness instead. The one from whom he deserved nothing chose to give him everything. Did it have consequences in his life? Oh, extraordinarily so. It had consequences in his family. His family was a mess. But he experienced that, and he was able to say, that his faithfulness, his chesed, follows me all of my life. Psalm, 10, psalm 100, another very familiar psalm, says, for the Lord is good, and his chesed, his faithfulness, endures through all generations. Psalm 106, 
Hallelujah. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His faithful love endures forever. Psalm 107. And I know I'm going fast, so I just maybe want to jot these down. But here's the thing. When it comes to chesed, once you understand it, once you know what you're looking for, you're going to see it everywhere. When several years ago, uh, I had taken my kids strawberry picking. It's something we like to do every spring and kind of just became our thing. And we were picking strawberries at this local strawberry patch. And my daughter, who was, I don't know, seven or eight at the time, maybe, she said, Daddy, I keep, there's so many spiders. I keep seeing spiders. And I thought, I haven't seen any spiders at all. How is it that we're like right next to each other and you're seeing all these spiders? But here's the thing. I, I wasn't looking for spiders. What was I looking for? Strawberries. I was so focused on what I was looking for that I didn't see the spiders. When she mentioned it, I said, you know, you're not wrong. There are several spiders. And once you become in tune to something, you begin to see it. See, I wasn't in tune to the spiders. I was so focused on the strawberries, I couldn't see the spiders. But once you become tuned in to this concept, to this word, this phrase, you'll begin to see it everywhere. But in Psalm 107, verses 1 and 2, it says, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is... Good. His chesed endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord proclaim that He has redeemed them from the hand of the foe. In Psalm 136, this phrase will be repeated 24 times. Over and over again. Because repetition is important. You see, encountering God's chesed is not just a one-time thing. It's not just something that happens at salvation. It's not just something that happens, hopefully, at a place like Chehi, where we come apart to seek God. But it's something that we need to encounter daily. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that on Thursday. But it's something that we have to repeat. It's something that we have to continually proclaim. Micah chapter 7, verse 18. Who is a God like you? That's another one of the prophets. Removing iniquity and passing over rebellion for the remnant of his inheritance. For he does not hold on to his anger forever because he delights in hesed. You see, God doesn't just give hesed. He doesn't just offer it. He delights. It's his joy to give that. You see, when we ask that question, what's the first thing when you think about, when you think about God? I want you to think about a God who delights, who rejoices to treat you not the way that you deserve. right? We all deserve God's wrath. We all deserve His judgment. We've all sinned. You, me, everyone in this room. Everyone in this world. right? There, there's none. Even in Solomon's prayer as he was dedicating the temple, he acknowledged, he said, we will need forgiveness because there is no one that has never sinned. And there's no one that cannot sin. But God doesn't just reluctantly forgive. He's like, ah... All right, okay, I'll let you off this time. No, he delights to offer his mercy and his forgiveness and his grace. But he does so at an incredible cost. Because remember we talked about forgiveness yesterday? That when you forgive, you're you're taking the burden off of the person who's committed the offense. And you're choosing to bear it yourself. And God chose to took the offense of your sin and my sin and bear it himself. Because remember, God is just. Remember when God revealed himself in Exodus 34? Yes, he is compassionate and he's gracious. He's patient. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in hesed. He maintains his hesed. He keeps it. He's forgiving, but he's also just. And because God is just, He just can't sweep our sin under the carpet. He has to bear it Himself. And He bore your sin and my sin in Himself as Jesus, the eternal Son of God, became man. He lived on this earth and He bore your sin, your shame. And He took it on Himself. And He suffered in your place. He died for you. He rose from the dead, defeating sin, defeating grave, and offering you the most incredible love and acceptance that you could ever experience. And when you truly understand, it's why I've been praying that you would taste and see that the Lord is good and that you would take refuge in Him. 
Because when you truly understand who he is and what he's done for you, it changes you forever. So what does this phrase mean for us? Well, it it should overwhelm us. Like, we should never get so familiar with God's love and his mercy and his grace and his kindness and his faithfulness and his loyalty that we get to a place where we just take it for granted. But that we are overwhelmed. That we find ourselves like the people of Israel, falling down in worship before God and praising him. I want to give you three, three, three takeaways from this verse, from this phrase, from this refrain. Number one, chesed should lead us to resonating worship. That our hearts should resonate. And worship is not just song, and worship is not just music, but it is not less than those things. Right? Because this, this, this loyal, faithful love of God, this covenant love, this enduring love, this forgiving love, this gracious and compassionate love that, that flows from who God is, Right? We can't fully understand it or experience it. And we never will. But music is a vehicle that helps us to understand it in a way that we could never understand it. And so as we worship God, not only are we giving Him the glory and the worth and the honor that He deserves, but it does something to us. It changes us. It transforms us. And we need to freshly encounter God. We need to freshly encounter Him in prayer, in worship, in His Word, to be overcome with His love and His grace. And when we do, our hearts will resonate with worship. We were made to be worshipers. You were created to be a worshiper. And God has made it possible for you to be a worshiper. And so I want to invite you to live a life of worship. Number two, chesed should lead us to resounding trust. Not just resonating worship, but resounding trust. Trust. Psalm 62, verse 8 says, Trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts before Him, for God is our refuge. Listen, life is not easy in this world. And the wind and waves of life will batter you at times. And tomorrow we're going to explore that a little bit more. But I want you to know that no matter what you face and no matter what you go through, that you can trust God. I heard it said one time, uh, a, a man who, he was on a houseboat. And there was a tornado coming through. And he said he was terrified because there really wasn't any way to escape. And he just hunkered down and he was praying and asking God to protect him. And the storm passed by. And amazingly, although it did a lot of damage, it didn't, it didn't injure or harm anyone in that whole community. And many of them gathered the next day and they were having a cup of coffee and they were talking about it. And they said, hey, what was it like for you? And the thing that he said was, you know, if I knew I was going to live through it, I would have enjoyed it a lot more. But here's the thing. If you're in Christ, you're going to live through it. You're going to live forever with Jesus in his kingdom, in the new heavens and the new earth. And here, while we go through trials and we go through tribulation, we go through trouble, you can trust God because his steadfast love really does endure forever. How confident could you be and would you be if you knew and believed His love will never fail me. Number three, chesed should lead us to rejoicing hope. Rejoicing hope. I love that last line there that we read in Micah 7, 18. He does not hold on to his anger forever because he delights in faithful love. And we have reason to live in hope because of who God is, because of what he's done and what he offers us. I want to give you homework. I've never done this. I've been a... But this homework was not something that will be collected. It's not something you have to turn in. It's not something you have to show to anyone. But I want to invite you to compose your own song. I want you to compose it based on Psalm 136. But instead, take truths from the New Testament. Take experiences from your own lives and weave them into a song. And so there'll be a line that's then repeated by their phrase, For the Lord is good. His love endures forever. And so I would invite you to compose a song that's personal to you, that takes the truths of Scripture, the experiences of God's has said in your own life, and use it as an instrument for your personal worship. Some of you are talented enough, you might set it to music. But use it as an instrument to give praise to God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your faithful love. I pray today that we would be overwhelmed and live lives of worship. 
We ask your blessing over this day, then all that will take place. May it glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen.